All right, well, good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to the Reagan Institute. I'm the Institute Director, Roger Zakheim. If this is your first visit to our new home here across the street from the White House, we're especially glad you're here in person. And if you're watching online, we hope you'll come visit us soon here. Uh, we'll be excited to welcome you. Before I introduce our special guest author tonight, I want you to meet our special guest interviewer. He's got the hard job this evening of throwing fastballs for our distinguished author. That's our good friend, Jamil Jaffer. Jamil is the founder and executive director of the National Security Institute at George Mason University, and we thank NSI for co-hosting this event tonight. Jamil is also assistant professor of law and director of the National Security Law and Policy Program at the Scalia School at George Mason. He teaches classes on counterterrorism, intelligence, cybersecurity, and more, I'm told. And his resume is as impressive as it is very long. <laughs> but there's one line that always makes me jealous in my good friend Jamil's CV. He teaches a summer course in Italy with Justice Neil Gorsuch, for whom he clerked for on the Supreme Court. And then when he would be prior to that, when he was a uh, federal court judge as well. And uh, Jamil, as you know, I did go to law school, so if you're busy this summer, I can step in. <laughs> Frago, my friend. Um, and now, uh, the star of our show. Many of you know former Congressman Will Hurd's biography well, a proud Texan, an undercover CIA officer, a cybersecurity expert, and a representative of a swing district with 820 miles of U.S.-Mexico border. He's navigated the black alleys of the world's most dangerous cities as capable as he did the halls of Congress and corporate America in all his roles. He's not shied away from taking tough, principled stands to protect America and our values. Hopefully, well, I expect we'll hear more about this, particularly his time in the CIA through our event this evening, um, though he's probably limited to what he can share. Either way, it's not a surprise that he once was dubbed, quote, the most interesting man in Congress. That's still got to be a high bar. You know, that's, that's impressive. And now this most interesting man who spent most of his career fighting threats from abroad has focused his attention on addressing the most serious threats at home, deep political divisions, a fractured society, and internal strife. His book, America Reboot, is, quote, an idealist guide to getting big things done. It's a call for bipartisanship and inclusivity. It's an embrace of the principles that uphold our democracy. It offers solutions. It takes on the shortcomings of both parties, especially those whose desperation for power leads them to make harmful decisions. And he has tough words for his fellow partisans. Chapter 3 is an open letter to the GOP titled, quote, Don't be an a-hole, racist, misogynist, or homophobe. That's just my pronunciation of the word. Seems like good advice to me. As Congressman Hurd has said, quote, being open to discussion and compromise when it comes to our disagreements isn't weakness or betrayal. It's a mature display of the values America is based on. Well said. This is a, that is a philosophy that President Reagan embraced. Yet it is one that feels foreign in today's Washington. And reviving it seems more and more like an impossible task. So much so that Will Hurd's critics has said his book is just wishful thinking. But when your career has taken you all over the world, stopping terrorists, preventing Russian spies from stealing our secrets, and putting nuclear weapon proliferators out of business, well, maybe you have a slightly different view of what really is possible. So, ladies and gentlemen, please welcome the author of American Reboot, Reboot excuse me, the pragmatist idealist, the Honorable Will Hurd of Texas. Thanks for being here, Will. And thanks to Roger and the team at the Reagan Institute, uh, Rachel Meredith, uh, for making this happen. Uh, super thrilled you're here with us today. Um, let's just jump right into it. Sure. So your book is titled American Reboot. Mm -hmm. You're calling for a reset of a return to our core ideals, our core values. What does that mean? What do you mean by an American reboot? And is that, is that really possible? Um, Yes, it is possible, and, and what, what do I mean by that? It, it first requires us to understand what our founding principles are, right? We, we sometimes get away from it. You know, I remember 
when um, many of y'all have heard me tell the story about how I ended up in the CIA, and it started because I um, was walking across campus as a freshman at Texas A&M, and um, I was a computer science major, and I had 400, and I see a sign to take, to take two journalism classes in Mexico right. City for $425, and I had 450 bucks in my bank account. There you go, pretty so good. So I go to Mexico, right? right. Fell Off in love, go. it was amazing. I did international studies as a minor, and the first class I took, I had a guest lecturer as his former CIA officer, I told these amazing stories. Yeah. That began my interest. But the first class I took, the first lesson, was on rule of law. An 18-year-old Will Hurd's like, rule of law? Of course there's rule of law. Right? It's a right. dumb class. This is like the first thing we're talking about, rule of law? Of course. Like, I was just, I was horrified. Right. And then fast forward a few years when I go places and live in places that didn't have rule of law. Right? Yeah. It, it makes you appreciate, I think my time overseas made me appreciate the, the principles that our country was, was built on. And why is it a reboot? Because I was a computer science major, and right. my first job in college was working in a computer lab. Alice, remember, Kane Computer Lab. You and me both. Yeah, look, and when, and when the computer was doing something you didn't know, what'd you do? Restart. You restarted it. You rebooted it, right? And, and you're not changing the operating system. You are getting back to a fresh right. instance of that operating system, and I think that's what we need to do. It's yeah. not about redoing things. Like, you know, a lot of my friends on the far left, uh, want to say that we need a whole new system of government. No, right. we don't, right? We actually need to actualize those ideas that have been enshrined in our, in our, our foundational documents. And so that's what I'm talking about, getting yeah. back to a period of time when we've already seen. Yeah. And, and so that's, that's what it means by that. It's a different kind of thinking. Um, you know, it's funny, like, even though I was here, yeah. I'm not a creature of this place. Right? I didn't grow up through the ranks. I, right. I wasn't involved in, in partisan politics. I, I ultimately ran for office because I, I got pissed. Yeah. I got pissed that in addition to recruiting spies and stealing secrets, I had to brief members of Congress. And I was shocked by the caliber of our elected officials. Yeah. And so that's why I ran. And so, so you know, I, I try not to be, be encumbered by some of the the traditional thinking uh, right. about this place. We just gotta do better. When 72% of Americans think the country's on the wrong track, guess what? We gotta try something different, yeah. right? And, and the lesson I learned when I was in the CIA said get off the X, yeah. right? Do, the place where something's going down is the last place you wanna yeah. be, do something different. And yeah. that's what we need to do as a country. Tell us that story. So you, in your book, you tell the story about, about your sort of a real world example of you getting off the X, right? This, relate, this you were in, you were abroad, tell us the story. And tell us what that tells us about what we need to do today to yeah. make that reboot happen in your mind. Um, it, it's funny after I after the book came out, I realized the first title is the first the title of the first chapter is "Get Off the X." Yeah, it's actually an example of not getting off the X. Um, and you didn't bail it; you stuck. I, I stuck, right? So, so what happened? Look, when you're when you're going to meet an agent, right? Someone's giving you secrets. You got to make sure you don't have surveillance. The local equivalent of right. the FBI following you. This was towards the end of my first tour, overseas assignment. And I'm getting ready to turn down an alley that I'm thinking is going to be abandoned. You're running a surveillance detection. A surveillance detection, right. And, and I made a rookie mistake. I cased the alley in the, the previous morning, and I was using it in the afternoon. It was, it was devoid of people in the morning. Yeah. In the afternoon, it was like a parade. Different traffic pattern. It, it's, it's super packed with people. I'm going three miles an hour. I'm in a Toyota Tercel small car. A woman walks in front of my car. I mash my brake, roll over flip-flop, drag her foot across the, the concrete. Toe busts open. She looks in the window and realizes I'm not from around there. A couple hundred people are banging on the car. I'm shaking the car. And not a good situation. Not a good situation. A CIA officer. Yeah, yeah, yeah. When, you're, right. when, you're, when your job is to be sneaky, uh, <laughs> this is not, this is not the situation the you want to be in. Right. Now, training says get off the X. But my car is not going to be able to make it through this mass of people. And in that context, get off the X means bail. Get, get out of Dodge. Get out of Dodge. Do not the, stay where the, you are. The X is where something is going down. Right. And the last place you want to be when something's going down is where it's going down. Right. Take off. Right. Couldn't do that. Had a weapon, but not enough ammunition for this situation. Um, so I did what was least expected of me. I unfolded my six foot three frame out of this little tiny car. And everybody was shocked that I got out. And then also, I was like twice the size of all of them. <laughs> and 
and I, I knew some of the local language are not good enough for this situation. I said, what, does anybody speak English? This kid, I, I will remember this kid's face for the rest of my life. He parts the crowd of people like he's swimming, and he raises a finger in the air, and he says, I speak the English. Yeah. Yeah. I said, did. fetch me a rickshaw. He gets a rick I said, where's the hospital? And he tells me where. I was like, fetch me a rickshaw. And I, I take a bunch of money out of my pocket, give it to the woman. And she gets in the rickshaw. My little translator gets in the rickshaw and drive away. And the crowd starts clapping. Because that's what they expected. Yeah, they're, they're not, they did not expect that. They start clapping. They're patting me on the back. One dude helps shoves me back into my car. I, 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 the sea of people part. I drive away, and I'm looking in the rearview mirror, and literally everybody's waving, <laughs> right? <laughs> and my heart is yeah. beating. Right. Because I'm thinking my mom's about to get a phone call. It's going to go the other way. Get. Yeah. And so, so I, I've had many years to think about that moment. Because that yeah. literally happened in the beginning of my career. And, and for me, it was a sign about how a show of warm-heartedness, yeah. showing a little bit of compassion, and trying to alleviate a situation that I put this woman in, completely changed the, the, the tone, the tenor, yeah. the feeling in that, in that group. These people were ready to drag me out and beat me to death, right? In a, in a slight change, and, and, and unexpected behavior had a tectonic and, 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 and complete total shift for these yeah. people. I think that example is where we are right now as a country, where people are in a car and there's folks banging on it. Some people in the car are inciting the people outside the car. Some people are, are ignorant to the fact that anything is going on outside of the car. There's other people in the car that, that are just don't know what to do and, 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 and they don't know what to do, right? Yeah. That's where we are. And, and, and I think also that even in this super partisan time, that some shows of warm heartedness, some willingness to be compassion yeah. um, will work. And, and, and I know that's true because that's what I've seen in my, in my journey um, as, as, you know, no, nobody thought a black Republican was going to win in a 71% right. Latino district. Right. And then when I got elected, Nobody was like, oh, I was a fluke. He's not going to win again, <laughs> right? And when I continue to win, people, people never, but, and the way I did it yeah. was I recognize way more unites us as a country than yeah. divides us. Well, let's talk about that. I mean, we are in a, in a, in a tough situation as a nation, politically, mm -hmm. socially. Um, you know, George Floyd was killed mm -hmm. a couple summers ago, um, and America exploded. Yeah. And America learned a lot about itself. Mm -hmm in those moments in the weeks and days that followed. You did something different, right? Uh, you were black Republican, Congress, um, as you point out, somebody nobody expected to win, certainly not get reelected, uh, with a background in the CIA and the like. Um, talk to us about that moment, how it went down, what you were feeling, in the days and weeks that followed. You made some big decisions. Mm -hmm. You marched in a parade in a, in a, in a protest. Mm -hmm. Talk to us about that and talk to us about what what lessons you take away from that, and what we as a nation need to be thinking about those issues sure. going forward? Look, I, I think what, what is fascinating about George Floyd, people say, you know, it, it really did wake the country up, I think in a positive way. Yeah. And, and some said it was the video. No, no, we've had video before. Yeah. Going back Let's to Rodney King. Go back to Rodney King. Yeah, I was right? there at the time. And, and, and what people forget about Rodney King was, Seven days later, a little, a little black girl got shot in the back of the head um, coming out. Of, she was trying to steal an orange juice, right? And the person that shot her, the, the staff, uh, uh, the store person, um, got off with a fine of $500, right? Like, 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 so, so it's not like this is new, right? And, and for me, what is so outrageous is someone who has you know, serving in, in the CIA, serving in, in a position where you have um, really amazing authorities, that requires you to operate at a different level and hold yourself to a different standard. And so I'm, I, you know, I've been very critical of, of the FBI, of my colleagues in the CIA, of people in, in law enforcement, partly because I hold them all to higher standards and we all should be high, holding ourselves to higher standards. So I was pretty, I was pretty vocal up front. Yeah. Black, a black dude should not be killed in the custody of a white person, of a white officer. It's just, I'm sorry. And even some of the things that's happened afterwards. 
Somebody is running away. Why are you shooting them? That, that is not the, uh, a, a normal use of force, right? You only use deadly force when your life is threatened. And when somebody is running away. By definition. By definition. You know who they are. You've got their license plate. Go knock on their door. That's where they're running to, right? So, so anyway, so, so my, my point was it, it was pretty outrageous. And George Floyd was originally from Houston. His family was going down. There was going to be right. a big, a big um, uh, 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 march protest. Um, Bun B, a rapper from Houston, was putting it on. I had actually got to know him. He'd come to my office a few times. Right. And so I went down. And most of my staff thought it was a terrible idea. Middle of COVID, right? And then everyone was worried that the, the, the article afterwards was going to be Congressman Heard in a, you know, a, a, a riot, right? And, and, but I felt it was important. And one of the things I've learned, um, you know, in, in, in when, when there's travesty that impacts a community, you got to heal and mourn together, right? And so my sister came with me. Some friends came down and we went and we marched. And what was what was beautiful about it? My sister like whispers one day. She goes, "There's more white people here than there are black people, right?" And I'm like, "Seriously, there, yeah. there was." And so I I think there was this there was this reckoning. And and for me, the point I try to make to people. We oftentimes think every, every issue is an or issue. Mm -hmm. It's A or B. It's rarely an or issue, right? It's usually an and issue. You can be outraged that a black man was killed in the custody of a white cop. You can be upset and angry by people rioting and looting um, in their communities. Right. And you can be thankful that law enforcement is there protecting us to exercise our First Amendment right. All of those things can be equal at, at the same time, and you saw it in the, in the march. And then, look, I was fairly aggressive on what I thought needed to happen. I thought this was a moment yeah. that we could have really uh, done something major. And to me, the most important thing that we could have done was make it to where police chiefs can fire bad cops. It's hard. Yeah. Every, poli every police chief, if you, if, you, if you talk to every police chief across the country, they know the cops that are most likely to mess up. And oftentimes when they fire them, because of some of the agreements they have with their police unions, they get put back on the force. We had an opportunity to do it, and we didn't because this place didn't show. Uh, Washington Congress yeah. didn't show uh, the resolve that we could have in that moment. And, and, and look, I, you know, uh, Democrats were in power. I would say that what the executive branch did went farther than anything the Democrats pushed up and passed yeah. um, out, of the, out of the House. So it was, it was an unfortunate situation yeah. where we really could have done something different. Yeah. So let's talk about that for a second. So, you know, you have a situation where uh, there was a lot of outrage, white people, black people, Democrats, Republicans, a concern about the situation of our nation um, and, and what was happening in the streets of America on both sides, right? Uh, on, on the side of the protesters who, who, were, who, who were rightly enraged about what had happened. Um, and then the communities that were upset about the, the damage that was taking place in the streets. And yet the debate seemed to turn about defunding the police, yeah, right? Or, you know, or, or, or police being able to shoot people. It, 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 the debate was not, I don't remember even the conversation about, yeah. hey, can we, can we get rid of police tenure when you've got bad cops, right? Yeah. Why, why, why wasn't the debate about that? Why well, did we get caught in this, this insanity of, yeah. of defund the police or, you know, police need to be able to defend themselves, thin blue line. Yeah. So, so it goes back to something very simple. Our, in the House, in, in 2018 and 2020, 92% of the House seats were decided in the primary. In the last non-presidential election, the average contested primary had only 54,000 voters which means 26,501 people decided, mm -hmm. on average, 92% of the House seats. Why does the House matter? The House drives a new cycle. Right. So when you win by 26,501 people, that's 2%, sometimes less than 2% of, of the entire population. Right. So the person that gets elected to that is talking to those people. I use um, Congresswoman Ocasio-Cortez as an example. When she beat Joe Crowley, in that race, in, her pri in the Democratic primary there in New York, only 25,000 people voted in that race. 
she got 15,000 votes. When I was student body president at Texas A&M, I got 11,000 votes. Yeah. Right? And, and so, so, so this is the crux. And so here's what happens. <clears throat> you can start having thoughtful conversations, but then some crazy idea gets thrown in. Right. right? Defund the police. So if you, if you start the conversation with anything other de than defund the police is a crazy idea, people are going to be like, wait, uh, well, you didn't say defund the police is a crazy idea. So it removes the ability to have nuance. Right. When you're doing a three-minute interview, right, and some elected official is talking about what's happening, they're going to rail on defund the police is a terrible idea, and you don't get to in it, It's a terrible idea. Joe Biden even thinks it's a terrible idea. <clears throat> so it prevents us from getting these conversations. Yeah. Another example happened, well, let's call it a year and a half prior to that, the issue of the border during the Trump administration and children being separated from their mothers. Right. Republican primary voters were outraged by that. Right. Right? Outraged. But guess what happened? The far left drops in a bomb, defund ICE. So then it moved the conversation away from the issue at hand. Right. And we started talking about this extreme, this extreme idea, right, which 80%, 90% of Americans thinks is crazy anyways, right? And so it hijacks the conversation and prevents the ability to have nuance or thoughtfulness. Now, you know, I, I, my, my staff always, would, like, especially when it comes to, to safety and security issues, nobody wants to be seen as soft on crime. I was able to, to be honest about a lot of these issues because guess what? Nobody's going to question. You know, it's like, hey, you spend nine years, most of that in South Asia, chasing terrorists. Right. And, and, you know, I'm, I'm not soft on crime. So I was able, I didn't have that fear or that concern right. because my credentials spoke for myself. But for a lot of my colleagues, R&D, right, they're always constantly worried about that. So that's why many of these issues around safety, security, and crime, um, gets, it's hard to have a nuance yeah. on it. You know, you point out that so much of this happens in, in, in the partisan politics and the primaries, right? Um, and you've been an advocate that the Republican Party needs a change. Mm -hmm. we, we, uh, we heard um, uh, Roger quote the title of, of your chapter mm -hmm. uh, in your book. Talk to us about, I mean, talk to us about what it's like being a black Republican, right? Because, you know, not a lot of black Republicans should be candid, sure. right? Um, and, and not a lot of black Republicans who want to, who want to run for office <laughs> yeah. and be outspoken and mm -hmm. talk about what that means and talk about what the party needs to do to change, right? I mean, the party is headed in, in, the party that I am in is a different party. It's, it, is, mm -hmm. it is not the party of Reagan sure. anymore, um, at least not in its current instantiation. How do, how do, you, how do we recapture mm -hmm. So, so what does, you know, I, I've been having a lot of debates with journalists when they say the party. I say, what do you mean by the party, yeah. right? Because a lot of people define the party as the senior most elected people within that party, okay? Yeah. Um, or they may be talking specifically about the RNC or the DNC, the organization that is involved in running a primaries. Yeah. But, but I actually think the party is so much bigger than that. It's the people that vote. Yep. for Republicans. And when you look at that group, yep. they're not a-holes, misogynists, racists, homophobes, right? But because of the, the, the few that do behave that way, right. that impacts all of us, right? And so we have to be mindful that that is when you're going in somewhere, that is the starting point. If you're under the age of 40 right now, you know, and, and you're, you're with other peers, um, some people have to whisper that they're a Republican, right? Yeah. And, and, and so, so, so that's what, th we have to know that. When I would show up to places, the first thing is, you're a black Republican? Right. Really, right? And so, so but I knew that going in, and I had to, I ha like, I knew what that, what that opposition was gonna be. Um, and so that's why I talk about those things, that we have to be pretty vocal. When I was running, because I was in a contested race, anytime any Republican at any level said anything crazy, well, Will, what do you think about your fellow Republican that said this? Right. I'm like, somebody who's running for city council 
in some small town right. in some you know place I don't even I've never even heard of. I don't care, yeah. right? And and so so that was that that's we, but we got to be honest about that. But there's a trend that I think has been happening for 30 years, that this notion that the only way to solve problems is through one party rule. Mm. It's actually the worst way to govern. Every piece of legislation and anything of any significance that has ever happened in this country has been done when there was one party in the House and another party in the Senate. Right? It's only been the last 30 years that we think the only way to get big things done is in that one party rule, and that's partly driven by, by partisans on, on both sides. Mm. And that's, that's a fallacy that we have to get around, and that also means that most uh, people running for office think about just gr this moving the current coalition of voters, not growing the coalition of voters. Right. And, and that's, that's the opportunity. Republicans are taking back the House in 2022, period, full stop. Likely to take back the Senate. And, and they're not going to take it back because the country all of a sudden loves Republicans. Right. And then the other sides are, are incompetent. And, but we're going to act like, oh, they love us. Right. Here's an opportunity. How about we actually put forward some ideas, get people to like us, talk about the better ideas that we have. Oh, and the other people are incompetent. That is how you grow a governing coalition that's going to last more than two years. Yeah. Because if when we take over and we govern via the authoritarian wing of the Republican Party, and I say authoritarian because I think when we talk about Trumpism, that's too narrow, right? Um, we, we, if we're going to govern that way, then all the problems that are going to continue in the 23 and early 24 are going to get blamed on Republicans, and we're going to see that pendulum swing again. So grow the coalition. Right? Yeah. There are more people. We have an opportunity um, to do things, but we've got to do things a different way. Yeah. We've got to stop fear-mongering. Yes, fear-mongering works. I understand that. But people want to be inspired. So we need leaders that are willing to inspire. Yeah. But that's hard to do. That requires thought. That requires understanding some of the issues. Yeah. That requires having tough positions and being okay with people not agreeing with you. One of the greatest things for me was when you represent a 50-50 district, no matter what you do, half the district's pissed off with you. Right? It's pretty freeing. Right. It's pretty freeing. Right. So just be honest. Tell right. people what you're doing and why you're doing it. And people aren't going to always agree with you. Right? That's where we need to go. And, 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 and those that criticize me, I, like, I know that's not where we are. Yeah. That's where we need to go. Right? If we don't have a vision for where we want to go, it's going to be a problem. Because, and why does all of this matter? It is no longer guaranteed that the United States of America is going to be the sole superpower in this world. It is no longer a guarantee that the American economy is going to be the most important economy in the world. Right? We are in a battle with the Chinese government. And, and, and they are, an authoritarian government can get somewhere first. Yeah. And if we don't get our act together to deal with some of these tough challenges around technology, around global partnerships, around a, a, an international economy, if we don't start dealing with those questions, yeah. we're going to get left behind. And we're all going to be acting like, you know, I, I talk about in the book, uh, Romans woke up one day in like 436 BC and was like, what the heck is a goth, right? <laughs> Yeah. Because the Goths overran a Rome, and nobody thought that the, the, the Western Roman Empire was ever going to be able to fall. Yeah. That's, that's, that's the stakes, yeah. in my opinion. So let's talk about that. You know, um, uh, you talk a lot in your book about the role of American leadership in the world, right, and the importance of American leadership. Um, and yet we are, admittedly, at a time when the American people, the average voter, doesn't appear to be that interested in America's role in the world, American leadership, or the like. We've... We're, we're, in a lot of ways, we're tired after long wars in Iraq, long wars in Afghanistan. Mm -hmm. uh, we saw the disastrous withdrawal uh, that took place just a few months back. Talk to us about what you see as America's role in the world, um, and assuming it's a forward-leaning one, mm -hmm. how does a president inspire the American people to sure. return us that, 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 that era sure. of Reagan. And by the way, it's not just Ronald Reagan, Scoop Jackson, right? It's not, mm -hmm. it's not a Republican Detroit thing, Nixon. a Democrat yes. thing. It's, a, it's, a, it's about an American thing. And yet, if you look across Congress, the last three presidents, right, there's not a lot of talk about American leadership in the world. Yeah. 
Look, and, and isolationism is not just a Republican thing, right? Right. Look, it was, it was President Obama who had the first thing, get out of Afghanistan. Donald Trump talked about it, and Biden is the one that executed on it. Right. So it starts, look, George Washington was right at the time. Mind your business. Don't get involved with other people, right? right. That was good advice 240 years ago, right? The world is so much smaller and so much interconnected, and we can't ignore it. We have built, we, the United States of America, built an international order that benefited us. The international order we built helped the American economy. Giving Europe a helping hand after World War II created a trading partner and created a block that is responsible for half of global GDP and something like 26% like of, of, of population, right? So that has benefited us. Oh, and by the way, it's easier to solve a problem over there before it gets to our shores. Let's talk about immigration, right? right. That's, that's, that's an example. Now, the problem has been our elected officials haven't explained that. When NAFTA was, at, like, I still think it was, it was crazy that NAFTA was a, like, issue in the 2016 presidential election. Wait, the thing that increased our economy by 400%? I think that's kind of a good thing, right? right. You know, like, like, why was that? Because, because we failed to explain why it mattered, yeah. right? And, and we don't have enough people that are focused on these issues that are explaining this to the public and why it matters, why it matters to, to you. Now, um, I was completely against pulling out of Afghanistan. I right. thought the beginning and the end began in the last administration when you negotiated with the Taliban without the Afghan government involved, right? right? And, um, and so, and I hate that term, forever war. It's offensive to me someone who served over there, someone who's, look, my career was defined by that. My, I started in the CIA the day of the USS Cole, and, and I basically left the CIA a couple of months before the coast bombing, uh, the deadliest attack in CIA's history. So, so my career was, was bookended yeah. by Al-Qaeda and, and the global war on terrorism. That term's offensive because 3,500 people? The previous year, only 11 people had been killed. Nine of those were in training exercises. Any death is bad, don't right. get me wrong about that. The n amount of money, yes, $2 trillion over 20 years, but it wasn't like we were spending $2 trillion every year, right? Right. Oh, and by the way, our footprint, the dollar amount that we were spending in Japan, Germany, South Korea, significantly more than Afghanistan. Oh, and by the way, I, aside, who are the only people that are protesting against the Taliban now? the women and girls that we allowed to go into school and, and protect it, right? right? I think that was a good sign, but we failed to explain why that mattered. Now, but the silver lining in the American public is Ukraine. Mm. When, 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 when Putin went into and tried to go to Kyiv, I put out a statement, we should give the Ukrainians everything and we should enforce a no-fly zone. That was aggressive yeah. on what, February 25th. Yeah. It was so aggressive, my first chief of staff calls me. He's like, bro, you're like way out there, right? <laughs> the public's not ready for that. Nobody believes that, right? right? Like, that's pretty aggressive. I said, but it's the right thing to do. And guess what happened? The majority of Americans have gotten to that point. Yeah. Why? Because they started seeing what was happening over there. Images matter. Why did Putin try to kill some journalists early on? Those were, that was not a, um, uh, an accident. Yeah. Putin wanted to get the journalists out of there so they could stop having those images be, be, be broadcast to the rest of the world. You also had Americans realize, wait a minute, man, food's getting high, energy's getting high, all because of the thing over there, right? It, it made people realize and appreciate the connection that this world is no longer a small world, yeah. right? But how do we continue to, to keep that on the forefront of people's mind, right? Europeans, you know, you're going to see a lot of more Eastern European folks potentially go the way of Hungary because their populations are dealing with the threat of war. They're right. dealing with the, the, um, 
uh, the closer you are to Russia, the more secondary sanctions impact you, right. and third, the growing humanitarian crisis, right? right? So, so the, those putting pressure, and so the, the longer this goes, the worse it is for the West, the, the better it is for, for, for Putin, so we gotta double down now. So, so I think this is an example where we have to continue to make the case why this matters. We have to continue to make the case that international institutions, we can't just take our ball and leave. WHO, yeah, there are a bunch of jokers there a lot of times. Right. But it's an important organization that we need to stay and show leadership in so that they're doing their mission. And, and, and I'll, I'll stop with this. When we talk about the Cold War with Russia, if America was a basketball, the old Soviet Union and Russia would have been a baseball. Right? The, the, the population was not near our size. The economy was nowhere near our size. Now, we also didn't have any interconnections. But when you talk about this new Cold War with China, mm -hmm. our economies, our populations, our cultures are more in a trine. But if we're a basketball, they're probably like a beach ball, right? Okay. It's a little bit bigger than us, right? Economy, some would say their economy has already surpassed ours. So it's a complete, and the, so the only way that we're going to be able to deal with them and make sure this international order that we created is done in a way that continues to benefit us yeah. is if we have a big posse. Yeah. And that requires us to engage in, in other parts of the world. Yeah. So let's talk about this competition with China. And then I, I do want to go to the sure. audience oh, for yeah, questions. Sorry. Yeah, yeah, we're so, so, you know, you've mentioned China a couple times. You've talked about mm -hmm. how uh, the U.S. may not be the world's superpower. Maybe we're even a basketball relative to China's beach ball. It's more vulnerable, but it's bigger. Um, talk to us about the role of technology. You built a cybersecurity company. Um, you're deep in the space. It's one of your, one of your, in addition to national security, one of your signature issues when you were in Congress on Capitol Hill. Um, talk to us about the role of American technology yeah. and, and its role in the world and its role in helping us win or, or compete uh, more effectively with China. And I mean, we're at a time where American technology is, is under political pressure from the left and the right, right? The left hates what it does to workers and, and the like and, and how it treats labor. The right thinks it's, it's, out to get, uh, it's out to get conservatives, right? Big tech, which is our most productive sure. part of our economy, is under significant pressure. Sure. How do we think about technology, technology investment, big technology yeah. companies, small productive technology companies, startups, in the context of the, of the fight with China? Sure. So two issues that happened last year that I think didn't get significant conversation. TikTok being the most g um, uh, searched website, and this uh, water treatment plant in South Florida mm. um, being hacked and almost poisoning the water. Now, I don't care if Roger's doing a silly dance to some top song on TikTok, right? right. <laughs> Who cares? Who cares? But that's what you want to do, Roger. You're more than welcome to. Um, I mean, it looks good. I mean, yeah, you know, yeah, I mean, he's got uh, the pink uh, tie. Yeah. I mean, um, but. All of that information, tagging people, you're training algorithms yeah. for the Chinese government, yeah. right? Why the Chinese government is trying to be the leader in providing technology that runs cities. Because if you own that technology, then guess what? You own the city. Right. And so, so and, and as I said before, your authoritarian government can get someplace first. The only way we're gonna be able to compete, and, and, and the space race is probably the best example. Yeah. The Russians had like 14, 15 first, and, and, and then they had a problem, and they couldn't evolve, right. but we were able to evolve because of, of entrepreneurship, um, freedom, uh, those kinds of things. And so I will always put my money on openness, on, on entrepreneurship, on free markets. Yeah. But that's going to require the public and the private sector to work a little bit better together. It's going to require us to make some tough decisions on, on regulations. Mm -hmm. Look, I don't need a 20-year longitudinal study that says if you wear something on your head, big old glasses on your head, that takes you into the metaverse for 23 hours, it's probably going to have an impact on you, right, your neck, all right. kinds of stuff, seeing those things. Like, let's start talking about what is the role of technology and what should technology do, 
We have left that up to many of the technology companies to come up with, and guess what? They're not going to come up with that because that's not, that's not what they're built for. And so, so we also can't let the, the, the Europeans drive this conversation. Right. They did it on privacy. Yep. They're going to do it on artificial intelligence. They're trying to do it on antitrust. Yeah, look, and, and so, so I think for us, philosophically, let's start with technology's got to follow the law. Social media companies were not different from TV, from newspapers. We should not have treated them differently, right? Just like an algorithm, it's if the, the algorithm is making the decision, if it makes the wrong decision, then it should be liable just like if you and I were to do something that would be wrong. That puts tougher um, standards on these companies, but that the bar, that's the bar in which we should, we should make things, we should ensure things are, are, are managed. So that's where we have to start because the Chinese are ahead of us and this technology is moving so fast. Like one of the areas that's not talked a lot about is, 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 is biotechnology. Yeah. I don't think we're ever gonna know whether COVID-19 was actually designed in a lab, but COVID-47 will be because the technology exists to do that. We can program DNA the same way we, pro we program computer code. I've met the people that are developing these tools. And, and look, I, I'm on the board of a company called OpenAI, and we're looking to get artificial general intelligence, AGI. Right. An algorithm being able to be smarter than most people on a thing, yeah. right? We just put out a thing called DALI2. You can put in text that says, um, impressionist version of the Mona Lisa right. painted with watercolor. Like that can be your search. Right. Hit return, nine seconds later, you get 10 images, right? And it's not like they searched the internet to find this. Pixel by pixel was created. So the algorithm had to know what, what does impressionism mean? Mm -hmm. What is the Mona Lisa? How do you uh, take impressionism and, and, inter and, and interpret that via the Mona Lisa? Oh, and then how would that be done with a lot of color? It is mind boggling. Now, we put restrictions in and say, can't do photorealistic faces, right? But you think the Chinese are going to do that? Right. You think the deep fake issues were bad before? Most deep fakes up to this point were caught because there was a real image that was doctored. Now you're going to have the capability to produce a brand new image that has never existed before. Right? Like, that's just one example of, of something. Now, oh, by the way, this is also going to be a tool for some kid who lives out in, in, in a rural area that's creative but doesn't have the tools to do things, and now they can make a comic book. They can, you know, uh, uh, express those creative, those creative um, um, things because of these new tools that are cheap to use. So yeah. there's a lot of upside to these things, but these are the kinds of debates that we have to have, and Congress has a role about the role of these things in society. Yeah. And so as we think about that, right, one of the arguments that, that, that these companies make is, look, you know, we've been so successful, right, and, and, and the nation has evolved so quickly and, 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 and engaged in this innovation precisely because we've kept the lawyers away, we've kept the regulators away, Washington hasn't gotten involved, and that's why we've had all this innovation. If Washington starts getting its foot in the door, you know, regulations, you know, lawsuits and the like, that's just going to kill the baby in the crib. Sure. We need innovation more now than ever. What's the best answer to that? It, it, it's, not, it's not one or the other. Yeah. Look, when social media was created, everybody thought it was a toy. But guess what? It's led to young girls increasing, cutting themselves. Yeah. Right? So, so we can do both at the same time. But it starts with, I, and, and I think this is where most entrepreneurs and most businesses want. Give us some certainty of what the rules are. Yeah. Define the rules. Just tell us what they are. Look, wh why do we not have a national breach standard? Like if, some, if my information gets hacked, I can't do anything, right? Now, I know why we haven't had one here because two opposing sides, financial community and the, um, the retailers disagree on this even though publicly they say the same thing. But let's start with who owns data? Everything I do online, who owns that? I have a simple idea. I own it. And I get to do whatever the heck I want to do with it. So guess what? Whatever tool you make better allow me 
Well, whatever I'm doing with your thing, I'm able to, to decide whether you can sell that or do that or keep track right. of it. Right. right? Those are some of the those are some of the things that you can say, hey, this is the base, and then everyone is going to program it and, and deal with that. So and, and nobody is saying regulation, complete regulation is bad, right? Uh, but, it, but it requires thoughtfulness. Yeah. It requires a competition of ideas. It requires a debate on these things. You know, it's, it, we always talk about the First Amendment. Look, I've, I've been lucky to have some serious debates with people from the ACLU. Most people think a black Republican in the ACLU are not going to uh, get along. But, but, but you need thoughtful people that th see an important issue from all sides to have that debate to say, hey, here is something that we can agree on. Let's start with that. And there are, on every issue, you can, f you can find yeah. out. Well, speaking of having a debate, let's get some questions from the audience. Mm -hmm. I know that we've got uh, some microphones out there. Yes. Hey, Will. Hey, hey good to see you, man. Rob Walker, uh, mm -hmm. fellow at NSI, executive director of Homeland Security Experts Group. Thanks for the book and thanks for the talk today. Um, and Jamil, this may hurt your feelings, but uh -oh. how do we get to these nuanced and thoughtful conversations when most arguments in this city are settled in 280 characters or two-minute cable sound bites? Look, it, it starts with, um, so if I had a magic wand, I would not design any district more than plus six in either direction, right? No, I don't have a magic wand. Um, one, encourage more people to vote in primaries so that you get the number of people voting and you're going to get more people that are focused on solving problems. So you gotta, if you want to change the kinds of people that come up here, you've got to change the people that elect them. That, that's step one. Step two. Um, p stop consolidating power in the hands of a few. 20 years ago, the appropriations bills were written by the Appropriations Committee. It wasn't written by the Speaker's Office, right? And, and so we need to stop having every, we need to stop having foreign policy driven by the White House. You have ambassadors. Let those ambassadors do it. Because, because we can make a phone call and email people Everybody wants to get everything done back here in the center. We got to decentralize that, right? And so I think those are some of the things structurally that now when, when, when the speaker has all the control or the majority leader has all the control, they're more influenced by the, flanks, the flank of their party than a, a committee chairman who doesn't care and they're more interested in taking care of their committee members, right? So those are some of the structural things that we can do up here. And then guess what, as individuals, are we modeling the behavior we wanna see? If we think social media is toxic, are we contributing to the toxicity, right? And so, so we all as individuals have, have that role to play in encouraging the kind of behavior that, that, that we wanna see. I always tell people when I'm not in DC, I say, none of y'all in this room have ever clicked on an, on an article that said Congress worked, <laughs> right? Because they haven't. Because we like the drama, you know, we like, we like some of that stuff. So, so we have to stop doing those things as, as individuals. I think those are a handful of things um, that, would, that would potentially work. Other questions? Sure. Hello. Hey, Long John. Yeah, I know. <laughs> You talked about the reason you got into Congress being that the, the level of intelligence was you know, a little low, yet a lot of these issues dealing with technology we see repeatedly time and time again, they're not up to the task. How do we increase the IQ of Congress mm -hmm. given that the, some of the recent inflow has been at the lower end? Sure. Here, what, I, what I would say about that, I, I was always shocked by the number of members that came to me and asked me questions on particular things, right? Um, people saw me as a cybersecurity expert. They saw me as someone who had, um, you know, rich experience in foreign policy. And when I was on the floor, random members would come up to me and be like, hey, Will, can you explain this thing to me, All right? So, so I have found that most members want to um, be knowledgeable on something, right? Um, but it requires us to have better staff as well, and part of that is more pay. I think some of the steps that have been taken is a good thing, but when my, when my general consultant is a multimillionaire, but my legislative director or comms director has a difficult time buying a home in Washington, D.C., 
that's, a, that's something that's, that's messed up, right? And so making sure that we're able, that if you want to stay here in this place and, and have a long career, that it can also be something where you can be able to take care of your family. I think that's super important uh, for this institution um, to, to continue to have that kind of talent. I also think on the, top, on the high end, the bottom end, of, of staffing, we can do a better job. And now that I meet with, that I work with a lot of entrepreneurs that have a, a major exit event, you know, they've made a ton of money. They may have sold their company and they've exited. And now they're like, I don't know what I'm going to do next. A lot of them would come work in the government for a year or two years. And these are high speed, low drag individuals that could do some amazing things that you give them a project or a product, a problem that in two years they can knock it out. But guess what? If they came in, all that equity they built in their company, their, their complicated financial uh, situation, they would have to divest of that and it would basically be poor. And they're like, I'm not going to do that right. for the salary you can give me. Right? So there's a way that we could have a real, you know, there's, there's, a, there's a category now called a special government, government employee. employee. Yeah. Still doesn't get, knock this out in a way where we can get that super high speed top talent to come into government for, for a short period of time. And then on, the, on the, 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 the younger end, people that are straight out of school, uh, National Science Foundation, we should be plussing up um, some of the programs they have for people that are going to get technical degrees to come into government. And I don't need more cyber professionals in DOD and NSA. I want them at Department of Commerce. I want them at, um, at Judiciary. I want them in, in, in all over the government. And then they, you know, if we pay this, if we give them a scholarship for three years, they come work in the government for six years. And then when they go back in the private sector, the private sector is going to loan them back into the federal government for, you know, 30 man or woman, a, woman days a year to come work on particular projects, right? Those are two things that we can do to make sure that we have this kind of cross pollinization of ideas of people in the public and the private sector to improve that, that interconnectivity. Those are, those are some very nuanced um, examples of how to do that. Right. But also, as voters, we should be asking questions that we want to see these people deal with, right? Like, at a minimum, you need to have an email address, you know? Like, there's, there, are, there are senators that don't use email. Yeah. They print their emails out. Yeah, that's the thing. Like, I don't even understand. Right? Like, I don't know how they would be able to operate in this, in this environment, yeah. but. Yeah, back. Jimmy, what's up, buddy? Hello, good to be with you. Um, great to be at the Reagan Institute. And thinking about your theme, American Reboot, let's say you had a magic wand, <clears throat> could hit reboot, uh, which is all I know how to do in my, uh, in my home technologically, and it works, TV, it work. internet, whatever. Um, but the code is still going to be the same. We're going to have the same tax code, the same election uh, system, same health care system. Uh, so if you hit reboot and we go back without any of the reforms that are needed in our modern society, um, we're really, and let's say you wipe out all the people and you just get new people and either elected or appointed, the, the system is basically going to head in a similar direction. Um, so if you agree with me that there, the code, you, you hit reboot, but you need somebody writing different code, um, which areas of reform, I, I think you're going to say in part election reform, mm -hmm. that's one of the things you said earlier, uh, but w where else would you prioritize our efforts? Um, and obviously one of the things in my mind is uh, some issue where there, and, and you've experienced it, where there can be Republicans and Democrats can agree, because we've sure. got to rewrite some code sure. in our sure. system to make process, uh, progress. So, so, so staying with the metaphor, right, a, 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 a reboot is about getting back to those values that have created this thing, and, and interpreting those values in, in 2022 in the 21st century, right? And so, so how, look, the, the Fourth Amendment, right? I, I, I don't know why I'm, I'm, I, I'm so fascinated by it. Like, in it, it's talked about how the unreasonable search and seizure, and one of the lines is like, of your papers, right? Because red coats were coming in, 
because they were sick and tired of people writing anonymous op-eds. Right. And so they were going in, looking at people's papers, trying to find the old draft, right? You know, like, to me, that is just, that's so, that's so crazy to think about that's why that was included in the Fourth Amendment. So let's take that same principle and bring it forward 247 years. That includes email, right? You shouldn't be able to take my emails after 30 days without getting a warrant, right? Like, so, so to me, it's about taking those principles that we have been founded on and making sure that the current way we operate. One of the things that we should be doing, and, and look, I'm, you know, I, I talk about uh, Matthew 24, right? This is when, um, you know, uh, it's, 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 it's judgment day and everybody's in front of Jesus and people on the left, people on the right, he looks at people on the right, and I'm paraphrasing, y'all are in, right? <laughs> And they're like, why are we in? He's like, because you basically took care of my, the least of my brothers and sisters, right? Um, our system has benefited so many people, but there are some that haven't benefited from it. Don't get rid of capitalism and democracy because some people aren't benefiting. Space special attention to them. That comes to education. I, I would start with education. To me, education, we have income inequality because we have education inequality. And so, you know, we should be making sure our, our schools are producing people that could go to college. They have the opportunity to go to college. Not everybody has to go to college, but they should be able to have the opportunity and be prepared to do that if that is something that they want, right? And so I think uh, having competition within, within schools. Texas has done a longitudinal 20-year study on school choice. Guess what? Black and brown kids that have gone to, to charter schools have zero achievement gap with their white peers. What the heck? Why, like, why, why aren't we doing more of that, right? And, and so to me, I think that's, that's one example of where we should be focused on. Look, uh, healthcare is another one. We spend, look, this, this, is, this is one of the industries that yeah, after talking to so many people involved in some of these debates, That'd be really hard for me to diagram it on a whiteboard because it's so complicated how it all works. It's the only industry where the person needing the good and service is different than the person paying for the good and service, different from the person deciding what good or service you need, and it's different from the person providing said good or service. Right? That isn't, that's complicated, right? So why don't we streamline that? And guess what? I know why you do it. Same way we, we brought down the cost of high definition television. Competition, right? Price transparency. Why is it? Why do I not know if I want to get an allergy test because I have terrible allergies? Why do I not know how much that costs? Why do I not know when my you know my mom needs a knee replacement? How can I not say, hey, how much is this going to cost? And who's going to do it the quickest, right? So, so those are two things that impact all of us, like making sure that we live longer and 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 fuller lives. And I'm lucky my parents are still around, but they're old. My dad's 89, my mom's 78, my mom has dementia. And thinking about these issues of elder care, right? I'm fortunate to be in a position to be able to take care of them. Um, but those are things that are going to improve our quality of life. So, so while we do need to, to edit some of that code, it's based on the values and, and, and principles that we, and, and let's take those and adapt and evolve um, how, we, how we do things um, from, uh, uh, look, why are we writing bills without the, um, sh you know, um, uh, what's it called a word when you can keep tr keep track changes? Like, really? We can't use track changes in Capitol Hill to figure out, oh, this is where the bills goes? Like, like that's, that's silly. Right. That should be able to be done right away. That is using the tools that we have, but that's, I'm not changing how we write uh, legislation, but it's just use the tools that we have in front of us. Anyways. Yeah. Can I have one more? Yeah, sure. One sure. more. Um, hi, I'm Jessica Jones. I work okay. at NSI. Um, oh, thank you. So you said a few times that we need to do a better job educating the American p public on, say, the importance of alliances, the benefits of the world order to the U.S. But as I was sitting there listening, I was thinking, who is the we? We're all about actionable, and I just think, is it, I think of the skepticism that's pointed to political leaders or the media. So yep. who is actually gonna be doing that message that's receptive? Sure. Is it, unfortunately, like the TikTok stars? Is it, hopefully, a singular individual that breaks through the fog and we trust? Sure. Like, who do you think that sure. is? Great question. 
Great question. Um, the first time I spoke at South by Southwest, this is a, a tech conference. And all, oh, it's, not, it's, it's actually a music movie conference that's added technology on it. Now it's like education right. and everything. It's like, it's like eight weeks now. Um, and, and I'm on the panel. I'm on a panel with a bunch of YouTube stars. The other four people had uh, uh, cumulatively one billion <laughs> YouTube subscribers. No, no joke. I had 60. <laughs> yeah, seven of those 60 were in this room right now, <laughs> by the way. Uh, and, and one of the people was the digital director for The Rock, Dwayne Johnson. And, and this was when the movie Moana was coming out. And she goes, if Moana fails at the box office, are we going to blame the customer, the moviegoer, or are we going to blame the product, the movie? She goes, well, obviously, if, if Moana fails at the box office, we're going to say it was a crummy movie. Now, I think Moana was a very excellent movie. Yeah, I think it had a commercial success. And then she adds, she goes, but in politics and in, in elections, it's the only industry that we blame the consumer, the voter, versus the product, the person running for office or the politician, right? So who is the we? It is our responsibility that if this is something that we care about and we are not getting a message to the people that need the message, then we got to change the way we do things. We got to change the way that we think, right? Look, I, I, I remember when I first came into office where I was running, I was like, I'm not going to send mail. Mail. This is 2008. I was like, mail. I was like, I'm not, I don't check my mail. Like, I'm gonna. This is gonna be my biggest expense. I'm not doing mail, right? But guess what? A lot of the voters use mail. So guess what? I did a whole lot of mail. I don't particularly like social media. To me, it's like the old uh, Christmas letter. If I haven't talked to you since last Christmas, I don't care what little Johnny's doing. <laughs> Sorry. Right? right? Sorry. Um, however, those are the tools that people are using in reading. You know, when, when you look at, um, people talk about the, the attention spans um, of people decreasing. But at the same time, we're seeing a golden period of podcasting and, and documentaries, right? I, I think there is no longer just one mass market. It is multiple mini markets or media markets. And that requires all of us that are communicating on these things to do a better job of getting that, finding out who the people are that we need to be talking to that are having an influence on this and doing a better job of talking to them. Because if we're communicating and doing things the same way now that we were five years ago or 10 years ago, then, then we're dying. And so the we is elected officials. It's um, think tanks. It's academia. It's uh, you know, you know, national libraries and museums. And, and it, it's, it's all of us that have had the, the, the opportunity to understand and participate in these issues. And we got to do a better job of communicating. Right? And, and, and I'll, I'll end with this. I think we're at, we're at time, right? We gotta do something different. We can't maintain the current track that we're on, right? It's, it's, it's not sustainable. Why do we call America an experiment? We call it an experiment because nobody thought it was gonna work. It didn't exist. This form of government did not exist at the time. It was another 60 years before another democracy was on this earth, Switzerland. There are only 14 countries that have been a democracy for over 100 years. We assume a democracy is, is a fait accompli, because this is all we've ever known. Right? But democracy is fragile. It always has been fragile. It always will be fragile. And it's our responsibility, because we have inherited this thing called America to make sure we keep it here and make it better for our kids and our grandkids. That's the task at hand. 
And guess what? To solve these problems, it's hard. It's really hard. But guess what? Those of us that can shoulder heavier burdens, it's our responsibility to try to do something about it. So I, why things will get a little worse before it gets better. I think our best days are ahead of us, right? I think our best days are ahead of us because people care and people are starting to wake up and be like, hey, enough is enough. We need to try something else. And I think there's going to be a come a point where a lot of people are like, hey, it's time to get off the X yeah. and do something else. Awesome. Congressman Will Hurd, really a pleasure having you. Thank you for doing this. Thank you for your book, American Reboot, An Ideal Sky to Getting Baby Things Done. You can get it on Amazon.com, Barnes & Noble, your local bookseller, support local. Um, Congressman, great having you Thank here. You Thanks. Brother. Appreciate it. Thank you. Yeah.